Hello everyone. Um, I have been for the last three days um, having a fight here with my computer over the microphone and other matters which I have not yet been able to resolve. So I'm using my uh, computer uh, microphone today. I hope be aware of that. I don't think the audio is going to be all that great. Okay. Uh, enough of that. I'm going to uh, take you on a retreat. A retreat, naturally, is quite different from study course or an academic conference. A retreat is a time to think about things we already know, not to learn new things. This is how a good friend of mine started uh, a retreat. Um, he gave a retreat of, in the 1990s, I think, to Catholic nuns in England in the convent Carmelites in the convent in the convent of Chichester, I believe. And he is going to use his, his pilgrimage to uh, Compostela. You've heard of it, yes? The Camino in, in Spain, in, in uh, northwestern Spain, it happens to be my hometown where I was born. But uh, my um, relationship with, uh, he was a priest, it was uh, Father Jerome Bertram of the Oxford Oratory. And my <coughs> uh, affiliation with him, or my, my friendship with him, was that he actually edited my translations of the mystics into English and um, he uh, helped me a lot and uh, he found me a publisher and so we had a, a sort of a close relationship. We worked together and today I was um, cleaning up and uh, going through old books in my little library here and I found this one. This, uh, talks that he gave to these Carmelite nuns. Um, he, he, uh, someone, I don't think it was him, put it together in a book. It's, a little, it's, it's not a huge book, it's a little kind of booklet. And um, <clears throat> explains uh, every step of the journey and he stops in every chapter to then talk about what that means spiritually and otherwise. But he starts his introduction uh, like this. This is the very beginning, the first talk in the retreat. I can express a hope that I'm not going to say anything that you don't already know perfectly well. <clears throat> My task is to remind you of things you might have wanted to forget and to encourage you to continue on your pilgrimage, whatever comes. Similarly, our daily prayer time, like a retreat, is a time to be quiet with God, not a time for intellectual activity, not a time for theology, and certainly not a time for philosophy. It is a time to be quiet with God. The Gospels tell us how the disciples were so pressed by the crowd, by people thronging with diseases to be cured, loaves to be multiplied, and mothers-in-law to be healed, that there was no time for them even to eat. So our Lord said, come away to a quiet place where we can be by ourselves and rest there. Many times we read that our Lord slipped away on his own to a desert, a desert place to pray. After that hectic day described at the opening of St. Mark's Gospel, the disciples collapsed into bed and it is only when they wake in the morning that they wonder where Jesus is and they find that he's been out in the desert all night praying. It is a natural and sound instinct to escape into the desert, to try and find somewhere quiet to be with God. 
Elijah, John the Baptist, the hermits who were the original Carmelites, all made a point of finding somewhere quiet. But the difficulty is that wherever we are in this world, wherever we think we have found a quiet place, whenever we think we have found a quiet place, we become aware of noise. There is nowhere quiet in this country, even on top of the hills, the downs or the Pennines. You will be able to hear somewhere in the background a tractor plowing, a nightingale singing or a raven clothing. Why, even within Carmel you can hear airplanes going overhead, to say nothing of the noises made by the community. There are distractions and noises wherever we are, and we must be careful to avoid the trap of trying to go further and further into the desert, searching for an escape. If you read the lives of the Desert Fathers, you find that to begin with, they just settled in Lower Egypt, like everybody else, and then they found that the noise of all the other hermits was more than they could stand, so they fled into Upper Egypt, fleeing further and further away from human contact. But even there, they found themselves continually being interrupted, as you might expect. The old legends tell of how wild animals appeared, often in amusing ways. Lions volunteering to do the shopping, stags taking refuge from robbers. To judge from the stories, being a hermit in the desert was one distraction after another. Certainly St. Jerome tried it and had to give up in disgust after a few months. There is no silence in the desert. I am talking about the search for silence because of all the senses, hearing is the most intrusive. Other senses can be equally distracted, but they are easier to cut out. We can avoid distracting sights by just closing our eyes, but that doesn't seem to be any way of closing our ears. So, if we are looking for total silence, we usually end up totally distracted. Imagine yourself in a deep cave, far underground, a place you might think of total silence, of total darkness, where nothing could stop us praying. But listen, somewhere far away there is a drip of water, some soft sound as of a slimy creature slithering over the stones towards us. There are terrifying glimpses of faint light that conceals some nameless dread. No, deep caverns are not conducive to prayer. We're just as distracted as ever. Even if you could find a perfect cell, somewhere absolutely quiet with no distractions at all, somewhere with no sights to allure us, no cobwebs begging to get up and dust them, no lingering smells of onions left over from last night's cooking, no enticing touch or taste of anything. Even then, we wouldn't be able to listen to God because we bring all our own distractions with us and our minds would be teeming with remembered sights, sounds and smells, touches and so on, and we are right back where we started from. That is what the Desert Fathers all found as well. If there was a moment's peace and quiet outside, they found themselves tormented by devils, all the memories and temptations of their whole previous life bubbling up inside. You can't get away from distractions. And so we really have to start all over again. Instead of hoping for a silence outside us, we have to look for a silence inside. 
That's where we have to be in a retreat, in an interior cell, an interior desert. Now, a remarkable thing is that the experience of centuries is that often the best way to make silence inside is to have some sort of friendly noise outside. Even unbelievers have discovered that. If you run a noisy factory, you put on music to calm down the workers, so that the sound of the music covers up the distracted, distracting noise of the machinery. You can override internal distractions with various sorts of regular rhythmic sound. That is the origin of the whole tradition of church music. You can't escape from distracting noises and thoughts, but you can cover them with the noise that doesn't distract but tells us about God. That is the particular benefit of chanting the Psalms. The regular plain song melody, the words of the Psalms, the music of the accompaniment, become actually means to interior silence. I think he <clears throat> goes on for a little bit further and let me find the right one. If we are afraid of the distraction of the senses, the way to attend to God is to let them not so much distract as attract. That is the function not only of sacred music but of sacred art, all the trappings and trimmings of the liturgy. All these things were designed to make us quiet inside, something which tragically we seem to have forgotten. The Puritans in uh, the, for those of you who are listening from a non-Christian world may not know this, but that they are part of the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation. The Puritans in the 16th century attempted to get rid of all these things like music and color and religious art and make everything absolutely plain. Absurdly, Catholics made exactly the same, the same mistake in the 1960s. They were trying, you see, to find somewhere like the ideal cell where there are no distractions. And just as the Desert Fathers found, when you have a liturgy, a form of prayer that is completely stark, all the distractions come crowding in again and you have no way left of getting rid of them. That's why in the wisdom of the Church, the Catholic Church, we are now rediscovering the sacred chant and the glory of the liturgy. That's something which was never lost in Carmel and I'm always glad when I visit there to see how beautifully the altar is prepared. The sanctuary has never been stripped, made bare and stark and grey, as alas in some conv convents and many parish churches it has. When I come to Carmel, the altar linen is always immaculate. It reminds me of how Saint Teresa of Avila was once blamed by Saint John of the Cross for providing scented rose water at the lavabo the washing of the hands. Of course, she said, everything must be of the best for the altar of the Lord. It is nice to find everything clean and fresh on the sanctuary in Carmel, if only it were the same in other churches. Things of beauty speak to us through the senses, and these can really become ways to make us quieter and more attentive to God inside. The beauty of the chant is something that makes it possible to be quiet within ourselves. The beauty of sacred art has the same purpose. 
look at the statue of Our Lady or the altar, the images, the crucifix, best of all, the Blessed Sacrament in the Monstrance. We need something to look at, to concentrate our thoughts. It is so much more helpful than having just a, a blank wall or the desert. It's the same with the scent of incense, candles, the feel of rosary beads in our fingers. We've got to have senses for we are human beings, creatures of flesh and blood. Instead of trying to deny our senses at prayer, we should use them. Let all our senses speak to us of God. When we pray, we can begin by listening to the chanted words. Every one of them speaks of God, and the sound and the rhythm are there to keep us quiet inside. Then we can fix our eyes on the crucifix or on the monstrance, and we can know that however much our thoughts wander, whenever we look back at the statue or crucifix or whatever it is, there is something to remind us of God. We can become aware of the scent of incense, the colored light from the windows, the feel of the prie dieu under our knees and the rosary in our hands. This use of the senses is something known to the Church for centuries, and not only the Church, but other religions as well. The Tibetan Buddhists have a natural religious instinct, using the things of the senses to make silence of the spirit. Their method of prayer consists of repeated phrases and rhythmic chanting and movement. These two our moderns have discovered. Many young people now enjoy listening to plain song. There are many tapes and records being produced by monasteries or convents, like the nuns at Ride or the monks at Fungenbold. They sell quickly because people find to, uh, that to have music in the background is a great help to recollection. It is the same with uh, some of the new music that is coming from France, such as the Thai Se chants. That's not something you can do in a convent. If everyone was playing tapes all the time, it would be absolutely deafening. But we can have that same sort of musical effect in total silence. By that I mean the long, tried and well-trusted method of prayer, which consists of silently repeating a phrase or a short prayer over and over again. We use words in order to be silent, a paradox, but our faith is full of paradoxes. The most familiar prayer of this sort is the rosary, repeating the words of the Hail Mary over and over again. We don't need to think about the text, although it's quite a long prayer, for we know it so well that it can flow out one Hail Mary after another in a great rhythmic heartbeat of prayer. We do not try to attend to the meaning of the words every time. If we were to think through the textual meaning of the Hail Mary 150 times a day, it would be absurd. But the meaning is still there, and every word has a meaning. The Eastern tradition is to use the rather shorter prayer to Jesus. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me. In the same way, repeat it over and over again. We are familiar with litanies, the glorious rhythm of the litany of Our Lady. Pray for us and have mercy on us, coming again and again like waves lapping on the seashore. Yet the power of this type of prayer is in the sound, and since we need make no outward noise, we can call it a silent sound, which brings peace to our teeming minds. <clears throat> 
he starts the, this is like an introduction for silence. He will go back to it time and time again. But um, let me just um, entice you by starting with his, how he started his pilgrimage to Compostela in Spain. Sun on the Foothills, Chapter 1, Finding Out The spiritual life has often been compared to a journey, a pilgrimage, a progress from stagnant normality to the goal of God's kingdom. I shall offer no exception. This book is to be structured around the story of a journey, an actual pilgrimage which I and a group of friends made five years ago. It was the pilgrimage to St. James of Compostela. I had always vaguely heard of Compostela, but knew little about it, until it came about that I saw an article in a magazine describing a pilgrimage. The writer, a priest, described how he and some young parishioners had gone off on this walking pilgrimage. He said how marvelous it was, how they walked in the cool of the morning and slept in the heat of the day and walked on again in the cool of the evening. There were ancient churches and pilgrim hostels on the way. The sun shone, the birds sang, and eventually they all came to Compostela. This account led me to think of trying the same thing myself, and so I began to make various inquiries. I didn't inquire quite enough, as you will hear, but I did as much as I could at the time. I found a book in the library which described the pilgrim route, showing lots of lovely photographs of sun-soaked churches of the south, shady olive trees and enticing taverns. Ilea Belloc told me about the flies the teas in the high Pyrenees, and the wine that tasted of the tar. I was warned that the rain in Spain stains mainly in the plain, so decided to take the mountain route, and I rustled up the appropriate maps, quite good maps for the French part of the route, and what look like adequate maps for Spain. I worked out just how far it would be, how far I could walk each day, where I would stay. Various contacts and preparations were made till I was confident that all would go well. I had heard about the pilgrimage, told other people about it, made a few inquiries and studied my maps. But basically, I decided to go on pilgrimage without knowing how it was going to be or when it was going to end. Instead of going somewhere familiar to a country I had visited before, I would go to a strange country and to a stranger place. I would undertake to be a pilgrim, to set out into the unknown. Now, each of us is at some time called to begin our spiritual pilgrimage through life. But it is remarkable how often our call comes apparently by chance, just as my Compostela pilgrimage was launched by an odd issue of a magazine that somebody gave me. In our life's journey, the call so often comes through chance, as remote as that. A magazine, perhaps? scanned in the dentist waiting room, an old newspaper wrapping for fish and chips, <laughs> and inside there has been one of those little advertisements for the Catholic Inquiry Center. You know the sort of thing, a little form to send off for a series of booklets sent under plain cover. Uncounted thousands of people have begun their pilgrimage through these sorts of contacts. Other people come to graze through a chance acquaintance. Somebody you met on a bus. Someone who began a train of thought that eventually leads to realizing that God is calling me to go on a pilgrimage with him. 
I'm talking about two levels of pilgrimage at once. The first is the fundamental vocation to follow Christ in the way of the Christian life, and this seems always to come as if by chance. I suppose the majority of us in this country had the fortune, first of all, of being born into a Catholic family, but that was just by chance. We could have just have easily have been born into a totally different family, perhaps in China or in some other area of the world where there was virtually no possibility of ever hearing the gospel. But our chance has been born to be has been to be born in a Catholic family. Then there was the chance of being brought up in the right sort of uh, parish, the right sort of school, so that we kept the faith of our baptism. Other people who do not chance to be born into Catholic families are at least born into devout families who follow God as best they can in some other religion. Yet others have no family background of faith at all, but again, by chance. They are sent to school where perhaps they find a Catholic child at the next desk. Sometimes Catholic children in non-Catholic schools do a, a tremendous amount of good. Or they may meet a Catholic in the workplace or even at university. Many of my students became Catholics simply because of people they met. You can meet someone, perhaps a benchmate in the laboratory or a fellow prop forward on the sports field or even a fellow propping up the bar. And having got to know them and like them, you discover to your horror afterwards that they were Catholics. That sort of chance acquaintance has so often blossomed out into the beginnings of faith and eventually the call to follow Christ in the path of being a Christian, being a Catholic. Beyond this, within our common Christian vocation is the special vocation to the religious life or to the priesthood. Then he speaks much more, um, he focuses on those who are uh, on the religious priests and nuns and so on. But I will leave that for, I think, another video. Thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye.